So we're here today with IGFA trustee Roy Kroniker. Roy, you just completed another IGFA Billfish Royal Slam. For those of you that don't know what that comprises, you've got to catch an Atlantic and Pacific Blue Marlin, an Atlantic and a Pacific Sailfish, a Black Marlin, a Striped Marlin, a White Marlin, a Swordfish, and any species of Spearfish. Now you can do this throughout the course of your lifetime, um, but today's a very special day. And your recent slam is more so because you accomplished it on the fly. And you did it with IGFA compliant fly tackle, which means you use no more than 20 pound class tippet and a shock tippet of no more than one foot. This is something that only four people have done in history, and now you've just accomplished this three times. You're the only person to do this more than one time. Tell me how that feels. Feels pretty good. It takes a long time to get it done, but um, I think uh, when that last black marlin came to the boat, that was sort of a big hooray for everybody. I mean, yeah. did it, you know, you started this quest, you got one, and you, what, what made you want to go after multiples? Yeah, it's just a challenge. I think the achievement of being able to travel the world and be able to find the right crews, be able to find the right fisheries, find the right time, is all sort of the technical side of it that you've got to really do some studying and, and plan well in advance to be able to get it done. I mean, it's a supreme challenge for sure, and I want to talk about the, the crews and how you line that up later on. Um, but before you, you start out to go to, down a quest, you know, to get an idea of a billfish royal salmon fly, I mean, you don't just pick up a fly rod and say, I'm going to do this. Obviously, you got into bill fishing on fly. Tell me a little bit about that evolution. You know, what drew you to that? When did this take place? What did you start fishing for? Um, when I moved to Naples in 89, I was at a dinner one night and I met a young man who I thought I had pretty much done most of the fishing I wanted to fish, light tackle, heavy tackle. I've done a lot of it. Uh, and he asked me, he said, have you ever caught a billfish on fly? And I said, no. And next thing you know, we were down Isla Mujeres fishing, I think, with Brad Simons and Scotty Kerrigan in those days. Um, and the very first Atlantic sail I caught uh, was a rush that I just never had before, and that was it. And that sort of just, from then on, all I wanted to do was pick up a fly rod. Watching a billfish come up and just woof a fly right behind the boat. Well, it's about the bite, but it's also you know about the control and about what you can do with the fly rod compared to general tackle. Yeah, yeah. So you know this when you started doing this, this was kind of like the early days for bill fishing on fly, wasn't it? Oh yeah, there was very few people around, and we were even touching the fly rod and knew what it was yeah. on salt water. Yeah. Do you think that the tactics and the gear have changed? significantly since you started doing this to where we are right now? I mean, absolutely. I, you know, back in 90 through the 90s, we did a lot of fishing in Mexico and down in Venezuela, you know, obviously for whites and, and spears. Our goal was always to get a blue marlin, and we were never able to accomplish it. And the blues um, just would rip your equipment. You just could not, uh, you, you couldn't get past the bite. By the what, was, what was the limiting factor? Was it the rod, the reel, both? As it turns out, as time progressed, we figured out it is not only the reel, but the rod. You know, you can have a good angler, but if you don't have the right equipment, which now has been developed over the years, uh, it's changed tremendously. Yeah. You know, and it's not, not that it's made it easier, but it's made it so that you can accomplish the task. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, these, these species that you have to go after for a billfish royal slam, you know, they're not in one geographic location. They're all over the world. Tell me about your process of how you decided which locations to go to for specific species and which, which teams you, you allied yourself with to accomplish this because it seems to me like picking the right spots that's going to maximize your chance for a given species is paramount. But then finding the right crew to be able to accomplish something on fly and there's not a lot of people that are doing this stuff uh, around the world for fly you know, in comparison to conventional fishing. So talk to me a little bit about that. Ten years ago, there were very few crews and boats around, I think, that were really dedicated to the fly fishing right. and the billfish. There are a few more than there were ten years ago. Um, you know, my, my quest became, quite frankly, uh, I watched Marty Rossi catch that, or heard about him catch a good friend, caught that first swordfish on fly, and that became a challenge. 
Um, we really dedicated, meanwhile, I'm traveling around the world catching everything else, but can't catch the swordfish. Right? Right. So you, 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 to get back to your question, to find the crews, um, you find guys that really, really enjoy the fly fishing. I, I remember reaching, re, uh, meeting Enrique Composi down in, uh, in uh, Golfito, and my boat was next to his boat, and he had his crew, and he was going out with Stacy every day, and I think they were fishing two pound test at the time, and he came in one night, and I was having a beer with him, and I said, how in the world do you keep a crew? Because fishing two pound tests, you're doing sing pow all day long. So it's just finding, and he just says, look, my people are dedicated, they love it, it's all the challenge, and you just have to find that yeah. mentality that wants yeah. to do it. Yeah, I know Enrico well, and it's, it's yeah. about finding those people that are dedicated to it. You know it's gonna be hard, but you're singularly focused on accomplishing that one goal. When we started fly fishing in, in Mexico for sailfish, I dropped down to eight way back then, and we had to bring on another mate all the time as a teaser mate. And 90% of what our boat would see is tied eight pound tip. And I said, what are you doing? <laughs> and we tell him, and he said, not with me, you're not. And they turn on a walk off and go down the dock. So it was hard to find people to be able to fish. Yeah, they want to be able to say at the end of the day they caught some fish. Yeah, they want yeah. the numbers. Yeah. yeah. So just just go over a few of the people that you fish with, you know, during these multiple quests. You know, like, you know, one of the things that I want this interview to do is hopefully inspire people, but also to give people some information on where they might want to target these different species and, you know, in these locations, who are people that you've used to help you, you know, accomplish this goal? I really started probably, you know, after Mexico, we moved down to LaGuardia and, and Venezuela, and I fished with Bubba and Jimmy Grant. Um, I don't remember if I fished with Chip when he was down there. I think I did. Chip Schaefer. Schaefer. Yeah. Uh, but I did a lot of fishing with Bubba, and, and they were very interested in the fly game. It was new. Um, we spent a lot of time out on, on the water. We were primarily targeting blue marlin and was never really successful. So, Starting in Venezuela, I mean, Bubba and, and the guys down there, that was, we'd go three, four trips a year, and specifically white marlin, blue marlin, um, and had a lot of fun. Um, we ended up never catching a blue down there. And one day I ran into Jake Jordan, and I went down with Jake to uh, Casa, now down to um, Costa Rica, and we went out on the dragonfly. And I really went to him as a coach because I've been trying this thing about the blues more specifically, and I just wasn't able to get it done. We get out there, and I mean, right away, first 10 minutes of sunshine, there's blues in the way. the fish are there. And the fish are there, and, and I'm hooked up and I popped the first three or four off. And you're using 20, I assume? I'm using 20, yeah. and I'm using Jake's equipment, as a matter of fact. Um, and Jake's looking at me going, shaking his head, you just don't pick, pop them off, it just doesn't happen. And he went over in the corner, in the opposite corner, in the transom and got down on his haunches, and I tossed to a, a blue came up, it was probably 150, 200 pounds, and within two seconds it popped off. And he came up and he grabbed my, Jake grabbed my left arm and he threw it behind my back like an arm wrench. And he said, now, the next fish that comes up, I'm gonna do this to your arm and you're gonna cast one-handed. And I looked at him and went, okay. So, next fish came up, we tossed the fly, cast, the fish is on, he's jumping, he's jumping, he's jumping, we're good, we caught the fly, we caught the fish, released it, it was my first blue marlin. And what was happening was, by fishing sailfish for 10 or 15 years, we always never had drag on our reels. We just used our hand on just on the edge of the rim. And it was just a light touch, right. you know. Uh, but that light touch was just enough friction. Oh, yeah. When, when you get a blue that's just charging and then he runs out, then it just boom. Yeah, I mean, you it. can do that light touch on a sailfish, but you know, you got a blue marlin, it's a Ferrari that feels the steel and just different. starts lighting up the water, you know. Different animal, Yeah, you know, different animal. So once we got past that barrier, that made things a lot easier. So I fished with Jake and, and his crew on the Dragonfly for four or five seasons, maybe six seasons, practicing on blues. Um, ended up trying this thing with the swordfish, which is a long, arduous hmm. uh, excursion, but finally captured one. And then that's when it came to a point where the light came on and said, you know, I can really you, get you this done. This. You know, yeah. we can do this. We just need to find the right guys. The second hardest fish um, for me was the Atlantic blue marlin. As you're fishing the Caribbean, and it's much rougher. Yeah. And it's much tougher to stay on your feet and not jerk the rod around and be able to handle the equipment appropriately so that you don't break them off. I think that's probably the other part of it. 
Um, so we had, for Pacific Blue, we had uh, the fishing down in, uh, with Jake Jordan and the Dragonfly. Um, I had to go for spearfish, and I went and fished uh, with one captain in Kona, and I ended up picking up another crew, Kevin McInerva, on the Northern Lights. It seems like uh, Kona is the place where people go for spearfish. I mean, there are four species found worldwide. You've got long bill, short bill, which is what you're fishing for in Kona. You've got round scale spearfish in the Atlantic. You've got Mediterranean spearfish. Um, but it seems like people really gravitate to Kona because um, spearfish are probably one of the rarest of all the billfishes. But yeah. it seems like you know they do have a really good fishery in a season where you can actively target them in Kona. No, you can, and it, and not easily. A lot of people go and spend a week and right. come back empty-handed. Yeah. I mean, they're either they're they're very finicky fish to catch. Um, now, speaking of the finicky, um, do you find that any one of these species, and we'll take swordfish out of it for right now, because I want to dive a little bit more into that in a minute. But um, in, in terms of the marlin and the sealfish or spearfish and, and sailfish, do you, is there any species that's that's trickier to tease? And, and it gets you in a position where you're able to present a fly and get a bite? Well, the easy part of that answer is the blues will charge and eat. And you know which way they're going to eat, and you know they're going to come in, and you know generally they're going to come down around, and then they're going to come back up and take the fly sideways, and mm -hmm. it's a perfect bite. Um, the spearfish are trickier. They, they, they hang back. Sometimes you get an aggressive one, but they generally are much more tentative fish, and, and you have to really... You use a streamer generally than a popper. Right. You have to get down to the water column. Um, the next one I would tell you is the black marlin. And the black marlin, I just came back from Exmouth in, in March. Um, we caught six on fly there, one on eight. Uh, blacks are crazy. They, they, they'll, they'll come back and, and they'll follow our teaser for miles. Mm. And you know, like I fish with Eddie Lawler now out of, out of Exmouth and his crew. But the black marlin will follow and follow and follow, and you just can't get them to tease, you can't get them to do anything, and then occasionally they'll light up and, and do it. So it's a whole different deal. So from that perspective, I'd say you're black, and then probably your spearfish are the most right. difficult. You know? Right. Yeah, that Exmouth fishery is, is really special over there. I did some tagging over there a few years ago, but they've got a little bit of everything over there. They've got blues, they've got blacks of the right size, if you want to do the, the fly thing. I mean, they're, they're not tiny, but they're not monsters. Um, they've got striped marlin, they've got a swordfish fishery now. It's just a really, really cool place. Yeah. It's one of the Absolutely. places I'd go back, back and, again. And I just saw the post recently on the swordfish, which got me geared up because I got a letter from, a note from uh, Eddie Lawler, and he said, your next trip, we're going to have to do 24 hours. <laughs> well, let's, uh, so let's talk about the swordfish um, a little bit. That, that is something very, very, very few people have done on fly. Um, and you've caught more on fly than anybody else now. Um, I'm not asking you to divulge any super top secrets if you don't want to, but um, do you want to talk a little bit about your program and, and, and kind of maybe some of the things you've learned um, in doing this? Not to put you on the spot or anything like that, but. Swordfish are a very unusual animal. They, they feed differently. They use that bill continuously. So when our teaser man is bringing that, that Panama strip up, which has a light on it, um, and that, that fish is just doing this all the time, and you can feel it tap, 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 and once in a while they'll grab it. But they're tasting it, they're feeling right. it, they're actually using it much more than a regular billfish, like a marlin or, mm -hmm. or a sailfish, or you know, any of the other species. The trickiest thing is to be able to tease up a fish from we're running our teasers at, and I'll tell you, uh, probably 120 feet deep. And that's enough with a light on it right. to bring fish up from three, 400 feet deep. But the, also the other side of that story is we generally, almost 90% of the time, see pups, smaller fish. Now, is this teaser in a downrigger clip or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so. So we keep it down. So tap, tap, tap. And if he grabs it, it comes out of the clip, and then you Oh, when he hits it hard enough, you'll hear that, that rod okay. hits in the rod holder, it'll bang. Okay. You know, and then it's a matter of just as that, as that teaser is coming up as you're pulling. The That's ball. how you're able to make that conversion. Yeah. So he's coming up with that teaser, and then you get But it's a blind cast. Yeah. No, it's dark. At the end of yeah. the day. It's all, it's all timing. It's, it's, it's talking to each other. It's the teaser guy constantly telling you what he's feeling. 
And as you get closer, somebody's got to make the call. It's generally me uh, because I'm on the deck and can see as close as I can in the zone. Um, it's interesting. It, it, it became so difficult. There, there are stretches that you run 13, 14 days and never get a bite. And you feel like you're just wasting your time and you just can't get it. I spent a lot of time on the phone with Jeremy Block in Kenya. And Jeremy's caught, well, he's got holes with the two world records mm -hmm. to date, along with uh, Faoud, I think, has still got one. I think so, yeah. And so those are the three, and they fish together. So when I spoke to Jeremy, he was very kind, and he gave me some good tips. And um, one of the things is that if you've raised a fish, don't leave. You know, keep casting. He said, because that fish is probably sitting underneath the boat, just waiting to see what's going on. And then you get to the tackle, you get to the effortless and fly. Um, you get to the timing, it's, and it's a very technical experience. Yeah, it sounds like it. So let's talk about the tackle for a little bit. I mean, what, what type of gear do you like to use? I've switched over from Able to uh, Mako because of the ceramic drag. Do you uh, have one in there that you can yeah, show us? So this is first the, the old, and I still carry it as a second, as a second reel. And I've got two of these still that he, that he built. But no, that's, a, that's the Able 5.0. And that's marked with three drag sets. And one is I see that. one pound, three pound, and six pound. And that's all we ever use. Um, and generally, you wouldn't take it to six pound unless you're trying to control the fish at the boat. Right. You know, three pounds, you've got to have that fish pretty well caught right. before you start backing off and start tightening up a little bit on it. But if less drag, I guess you keep them at the surface more than... Keep them at the surface yeah. more than like most light tackle fishing. This is one that I had custom built by Mako. Wow. These yeah. things are gorgeous. They're a work of art. And that again is marked with three drag sets. I see that. So it makes it easy to go from. But the smoothness of that ceramic drag is, is the key. Uh, so for rods, who's making your rods? The custom or... So I went to the Carmen Brothers at the time at Biscayne Rod. Yeah, that's a number of that's years. That's no mistake, and you can see a tell a Biscayne Rod right away when you see them. Yeah. And of interest, the last trip that I had to uh, to Exmouth, we switched to eight on a black, and I used an eight pound Biscayne Rod that Eddie owned, and Eddie had bought it from um, from Dean Butler, and. I was told that it was Tom Evans' rod, and Tom and I are friends. And Tom lives just up the road from me in Jackson Hole. And like Tom, I didn't know you guys were that close. Oh yeah. So and and, and Tom, <laughs> Tom's a bear, and I, I told him I said if I catch an eight pound record using Tom Evans' old rod, I said I'll never be able to turn it in. I said because Tom will go nuts. But the good news was that when in fishing with that rod, it changed the whole experience by stepping down. Did it? So I could still use the large Mako reel, and because the drag is at zero almost, uh, but by going to the lighter rod, then I could be able to control the right. fish and, and, and bend with the fish and do what I need to. Oh, fly. So I'm, I'm intrigued. What, what type of flies are you using for these different critters? Well, originally, we use Cam Ziegler's uh, fly with a popper on it. So the popper and the half chicken. Before that, there was a concave popper that we used to buy, tie our own flies, and just use blue and white flies with tandem hooks. So, I mean, this may, we're now using um, a similar head. These have all been used, but that would be my favorite popper head today. They're, they're more difficult to get. What we're getting more of today, and I don't tie my own flies, by the way, but Jake Jordan does these with me. I don't particularly care for the foam popper, only in the fact that it just doesn't give the splash. Push the water right. You know? But the fly has got a lot of body to it. Right. It can be easily seen. It's got a big eye to it. So it's, it's a big enough prey for a billfish to pay attention to. Except for spearfish, which are going to want a little bit of a blue and, and yeah, I'm curious about the color. It seems like pink and white is a perennial favorite for people that are chasing sailfish or blue marlin. Um, pink or white, blue and white. Yeah, either one seems to yeah. work. You know, if I was fishing lures, I'd, I'd want all black. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. This, the we flies are going through generations. So we fished two hooks tandem, and have been and still are. 
Um, we're experimenting now with a single hook rig. Um, we're finding out that a lot of times you get a, with a tandem hook, the bill would get between the wire, between the two hooks mm -hmm. and hit it. Sometimes you come back with a wire that looks like it's been hit at 90 degrees because it's been smacked and whatever right. it was is foul hooking and or just a missed, it won't seat. You know, I can't get to it. So we're going into single hook rigs and trying those. We're getting some pretty good uh, results. These are the ones that we've been using for our swordfish. I don't know if I've got theirs. These are all double hook rigs, I believe, in our own. So that's the most recent one that we've done, and that's a single hook rig. This is the latest evolution right here. Yeah. And this is another single hook, so this is, no, this is double. That's we got one uptight and then a trailer hook. And all of this is effervescence. Is that right? Yeah. So part of the trick is to be able to keep light on this and before you toss it. And there's a whole setup that has to be done. Some secrets I can tell you. Yeah. Some secrets I'm not going uh, to get into. It. Because I, this one was too simple, but it, it's very effective. Now, uh, this looks relatively light in terms of your shock here. What is this? Do you have any idea? Um, that's probably 60, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, free light. Yeah. And it looks like you've got bimini's at both ends. So you've got a bimini to it looks like probably a huff nagel to your shock, and then you've got yep. a bimini at the other end so you can loop your fly in and out to yep. your butt section. Yep. Great connections there. Very cool. Well, I won't make you divulge any more secrets on your flies, but uh, thanks for sharing those with us. Yeah, I mean, the, the poppers are getting hard to find. I'd, I'd like to do it. It's interesting. You can also. I mean, I, I went to a tackle store one day and they had a bunch of them. They had these flies that were actually made, I think, at the time in China. And they're just streamers. And we're, we will, at times, pull those out because they've got big body and they're easy enough to use. I'm seeing more and more of these being used, you know, and um, from people that I know that build fish um, on fly and from some records that I've seen, these flashy profile with a little bit of lead in, uh, in the front to get it down. Tell me what you think about, you know, the the surface light versus, you know, these kind of flies that are made for subsurface. I think there are times that you probably have to opt for, you know, a subsurface fly, but for you, what, what's your what's your favorite? Well, favorite's the popper because you can actually, um, I, um, Timmy uh, Richardson just did a post recently with me fishing with him, and we have a program where I will toss the Garrett's over in the far left on the side of the cockpit, and he's teasing. And as that fish comes up, I'll walk to the center of the cockpit, and I actually toss my fly into the clean white water between the main wake and the second wake, so that both Tim and I can see the fish. And if you, especially if you're using streamers, but right. when you're using these, when you pop it, then we can both yeah, see right. the fish come up and bite. It right. makes it easier. Plus, we know the fish is looking for it because right. the teaser's gone. He's just looking for something to eat. And he's turning around. There are times you just can't get them to get up. They just won't. They, you know, you can't. They won't pay any attention to it. We don't know if it's because they're sitting deeper in the water column, or just something is not attracting them. We'll switch to a streamer with a 550 grain, and it, we always have 550 grain lines on the fly rails. Um, you get that fly down into the water column, five, six feet deep, and there's a times when the fish just won't leave them alone. Yeah, you know? do you find that you have a better hookup percentage with um, a subsurface fly without the foam head, or vice versa? I don't really know that I, I notice much difference. I think it's just a matter of what the animal's gonna eat it today. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that uh, we haven't had any problems with the foam heads fouling. Yeah. You know, or or or, or them grabbing the foam and not finding the hooks. No. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had seen any of that. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not they're seeing the, the, the yeah. fly. Yeah. You know, and are they eating? That's always the case. It's always the case. If they're not eating. Doesn't matter what you have. But you can take a box like this, and I mean, this box just came back from Australia. And between extra fly line, leaders, hook sets, and everything else, you've got everything you need to be able to go fishing. I remember the days when I used to carry rod tubes that were made out of PVC, and you had to get them at the back door of the plane, the yep. place, and drug all that stuff around. But 
a lot easier now with multi-piece rods, rod bags that are made for tackle and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Well, the good thing about these guys, you know, when you're going out and doing the Royal Slam, that's all catch and release, so that's, that's one good thing. So you are, you are going to keep going on that pursuit. Oh yeah, I mean, fly fishing is, I, I love to do all kinds of fishing, um, but my, 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 first, my first love is to pick up this bag and get on a plane and go, you know, just go catch another one. So, I just saw on Facebook today uh, a guy that we both know that made a post that said he wants to go out and get a Billfish Royal Slam on fly in a year. What advice would you give to anybody that's trying to get a Billfish Royal Slam on fly, whether it's in one year or over the course of five or ten years? If you're going to try to do it in a year, you really just have to have the contacts. Yeah. And you have to know the time. You have to know, you know, what time to be where. You gotta have a plan. And you have a plan, and then you gotta be able to spend the time. So you just can't go fly halfway across the world and expect to go do it in three days. I mean, you better be booking seven to ten days and hope that you do it. You know. So it's kind of kind of gotten addicted to you. A oh bit. Yeah. yeah. It's a bunch of fun for all the good reasons. Now, if you had to pick one of these fish to fish for on fly, do you have a particular favorite or they're all cool in their own way or? I still love blue marlin. Yeah. I mean, I, they, they, they are the most raucous fish I know. They get out there and they fight, they run, they, they, they jump. They, they really give you a fight. I, I think obviously the, the most uh, rewarding becomes the swordfish because just all the time you're yeah. running in it. When you get one to the boat, it's yeah. just amazing. Each one has got to yeah. be just a piece of gold. Oh yeah. Yeah, and they're, you know, they're the toughest of the group. Well, Roy, congratulations on your third Royal Billfish Slam on fly. I look forward to seeing a fourth from you, and uh, thanks for coming in and talking to us about it today. Great. Enjoyed it.